start recording. Oh, here we go. See, I told you he knows how to do all those things. Okay, so this is going to be the first of a series. Um, I'm looking at a monthly series of talks, which I'll uh, tell you more about in just a moment. Um, and um, uh, before I go any further, I should acknowledge that this is coming to you from the ancestral lands of the Abenaki, um, who are the ancestral people of Northern New England, upstate New York, um, Southern Quebec. And um, I am doing a number of projects with the Abenaki, uh, which I'll tell you about on a future occasion. But I do want to recognize um, their, uh, their existence, their right to exist, their, their place in the land. This is going to turn out to be a really important feature of the endangered alphabets in general. Um, so uh, I'm going to use a PowerPoint presentation, which I hate. Um, I love looking at you and seeing you all up there, um, but I've just got a lot of stuff that I want to show you. And I'm also going to have a little bit more text than usual because what I'm going to say today has a number of points that I think are unusual and I think are, are worth making really clearly. Um, and, and obviously those of you for whom English is not your first language, it may be easier to see something in writing while I'm saying it, although I may well say something different. Uh, I'm afraid I'm like that. Um, so with that in mind, I'm going to do um, screen sharing. And I'm going to go into uh, here and uh, click on here. And then I am going to do slideshow, play from the start. OK, so as I say, uh, this is the first of what I'm planning as a monthly series, um, talking about writing a monthly series of conversations about writing that in 35 years as a writer, I never thought to ask. So this is, this is one of the most important features of the Endangered Alphabets project. I came into it not as a linguist or an anthropologist, but as a writer. And more and more, I began asking myself questions about writing itself. As um, over the coming months, um, I'm going to be sharing those conversations with people who know all kinds of things that I don't. Um, we're going to have calligraphers and graphic designers, people whose specialty is early writing, um, paleography, um, and uh, typographers, because these are the people who are doing the most interesting thinking and, uh, and research into the aspects of writing that I'm most interested in. Um, as a, as a writer myself, I thought I, was, um, I thought I was doing the right thing by asking the question, how do I use my language to get my point across or to affect people? But it turns out that there are so many different ways of thinking about writing that we don't discuss. And one of the purposes of today's talk is actually to ask the question, wait a second, why not? Why don't we ask those questions? And so uh, we're starting out with uh, writing beyond writing, um, which is not by coincidence, the title of my um, forthcoming book. Um, I am gonna make um, countless appeals to you to support our Kickstarter campaign so I can actually publish this book. The talk today is not going to be, it's not gonna duplicate everything in the book, but it is gonna cover some of the material that's in one of the chapters. So. Don't forget that title, the Kickstarter link is coming up at the end. And by the way, some of you have already supported that Kickstarter for which I say many thanks. So today I'm gonna to be asking amongst other things, three kind of unusual questions. Uh, what is writing? Who owns the definition of writing? And Olesh, who's in the group today, and I talk about this quite a lot. And what do we discover when we go beyond that definition? So writing beyond writing is, um, in some sense, about the work of the endangered alphabets, where I go beyond the realm of the Latin alphabet and out among the endangered writing systems around the world. But we're also going beyond that 
rather, as we all see, um, narrow and even um, stultifying definition of writing that uh, is used in the West. And we'll see what that is in just a second. Okay, so here is this uh, wonderful piece of, of 18th century writing by Edmund Fry. The desire of communicating ideas seems to be implanted in every human breast. The two most useful methods of gratifying this desire are by sounds addressed to the ear or by representations or marks um, exhibited to the eye, or in other words, by speech and writing. The first method was rendered more complete by the invention of the second. Don't forget that, rendered more complete by the invention of the second, because it opened a door to the communication of ideas through the sense of sight as well as that of hearing. Speech may be considered as the substance and writing as the shadow that follows it. Now listen to this, the art of drawing ideas into vision or of exhibiting the conceptions of the mind by legible characters may justly be deemed the noblest and most beneficial invention of which human ingenuity can boast. An invention which has contributed more than all others to the improvement of mankind. What I find absolutely fascinating about this, uh, two things. One is that he's talking about writing in these extraordinarily enthusiastic um, terms, noblest, most beneficial. We'll come back to that in a second. But the other thing is he talks about this really interesting um, phenomenon of drawing ideas into vision. In other words, taking the immaterial, a thought, and making it material, a piece of writing taking the private and making it public. That is an extraordinary idea that we're gonna address in other talks in this series. Um, but it's just one way of showing that this is somebody who's thought quite a lot about what is writing in ways that typically we don't. Drawing ideas into vision. So instead, if I look at a contemporary definition of writing, not from 1799, but from now, um, writing is a means of using abstract visible symbols to represent the sounds of speech. So um, there are two things about this. Actually, there's many things about this that I find disturbing. One is that the sense of wonder and appreciation, enthusiasm is completely absent. Second thing is that it's, uh, it limits writing to the notion that these are symbols that represent the sounds of speech, that's all. And I started thinking about this and, and th I thought, you know, that sounds very reasonable, but is that it? And I'm gonna be arguing, no. <laughs> That is not it. And in fact, this definition of the word writing is what we're going to go beyond in this talk. So you may ask yourself, so where did that notion come from um, that writing is, is just about uh, representing the sounds of speech? And also, um, what is writing compared to other forms of graphic representation of meaning? So let's look at the in, in the 19th century. Here we have uh, Lewis Henry Morgan argued that writing, especially the written alphabet, was the sole innovation that marked the passage of humankind from what he called the upper status of barbarism to the final and consummate status of civilization. So what that means, of course, is that in 1877, he was very well aware that there were many societies around the world that didn't use writing as he understood writing. And as far as he's concerned, they are barbaric. And it's only writing as he understands it that gives a culture the status of civilization. Um, so then, uh, around around the same time, Edward Burnett Tyler researches in the early history of mankind and the development of civilization. Now, just that word again, he proposed that writing progressed from ideograms through to verbal, syllabic, and finally alphabetic glyphs 
each step denoting the intellectual and social progress of that society. So um, two ideas going on together here. One, if you don't have writing, you're barbaric. Two, that civilizations evolve from one state to another, if they're smart, and they wind up using an alphabet. This is not a new idea. Um, actually, Edmund Fry says exactly the same thing in 1799, but he doesn't talk about writing in terms of um, this progress towards what I'm calling an Anglo-Victorian ideal, that because we use the alphabet and we're top dog, therefore, um, this is an evolution of the nature of writing. And those societies that have not done that yet clearly haven't evolved in that fashion. Which is, and this, of course, is not only elitist and colonialist, but racist. And here, Alec, can we do anything about this scroll that somebody has Zoom bombed us? I don't know whether we can or not. Um, so they, here is a picture of Rudyard Kipling, although frankly, he could be any man of letters from that Victorian era in his drawing room there with his, his uh, artwork and his brilliant, thanks so much, and his, uh, his books. So in one of the Just So stories, and, and let's not forget that Kipling won the Nobel Prize. He was the preeminent storyteller of um, Imperial um, Britain. And in, he has a, a, a just so story about how the alphabet was made. And I won't go into the whole story, but right towards the end, he says, and, he, and he's writing this for children. It's intended to be a popular um, thing. And after thousands and thousands and thousands of years, and after hieroglyphics and demotics and nilotics and cryptics and kufics and runics, the fine, old, easy, understandable alphabet got back into its proper shape again. So there are so many things wrong with that sentence, but what it really illustrates is the belief, which we're seeing now in the mid 19th century and which many people still hold today, that um, other forms of writing are stations along the line and that it's really the alphabet that matters. And in fact, very often you'll see people writing about the alphabet as if there is only one alphabet. There's also this really strange undertone here, which somehow implies that the alphabet predates all of these other writing forms because he uses the word again. Um, so uh, yes, there is this tremendous sense of Victorian smugness about the definition of how writing evolved to where it is now, which implies also a definition that this is what writing is, namely what we're using now in the West, I should stress. This notion actually is carried virtually into the present day, um, thanks to an extremely, um, a series of extremely influential uh, linguists who were um, so focused on the study of spoken language, which of course I, I totally approve of, it's great, um, that uh, they, they influenced where linguistics itself would go. And so I'm thinking in particular of, of um, Ignace Gelb. And um, so we have a, a, um, a nice little summary here. Uh, and by the way, if we look at the bottom, uh, Philip J. Boyce, Philippa M. Steele. So Pippa Steele is actually going to be my guest on one of these conversations coming up soon. She's an expert in early writing systems. Um, so Gelb's so-called grammatology focused on the analysis of the structural and formal elements of writing systems and how these evolved historically from a logographic to an alphabetic system. So he is really saying this evolution is uh, the principal source of study of writing. And um, it is, of course, uh, nonsense on many grounds. And in another of our talks, in fact, probably with Pippa, uh, we'll talk about why that's nonsense. But then she goes on to say, he essentially disregarded other aspects of writing practices, considering them to be a matter for other research areas. And that is why in the field of linguistics, the area of spoken language is addressed in 
in countless really specific, interesting, thoughtful ways. And writing isn't. And so the reason why I can ask these unusual questions actually is because I don't have this formal education in linguistics, which would have steered me elsewhere. Also because I learned by carving and asking questions. So this notion of evolution then is a great example of the fact that history is written by the winners. And in this case, in the alphabet of the winners. If our writing system is top dog in the world, therefore um, it was meant to be. There is something about the Latin script that makes it inherently superior, more useful, more convenient, whatever. This is also nonsense, by the way. The Latin alphabet has come to dominate the world not because of any intrinsic values. Um, you ask anybody who is learning the Latin alphabet from some other language writing basis, and they'll tell you, it's really hard, it's really nonsensical. But because at crucial moments in history, it had more lawyers, guns, and or money than someone else. So what we're going to do is now, for the rest of this talk, look at the someone else. So an endangered alphabet is frequently one that has been conquered or overrun or marginalized by the Latin alphabet or some other major writing system. And by looking at these minority systems, we can learn a great deal, not only about them and their culture, but about writing itself and about how wrong we are about many things about writing. Whoops, excuse me, I just hit my own laptop with my hand. So we're going um, to look in particular at Africa, actually, at West Africa. And we're going to start out by looking at the Bamum script, which many of you know about already. And in fact, many of you are actually supporting the endangered alphabet's efforts to revitalize the Bamum script. Um, this is uh, a one of uh, a three-part carving that I did um, uh, for International Mother Language Day, which said the right to speak, the right to read, the right to write. This says the right to read, and that is the Bamum script. So um, again, some of you know this already, the story. Um, so this is um, Sultan Ibrahim Joya, who starting at the end of the 19th century, came up with really an extraordinary insight, really, really worth thinking about. He decided, or he realized, that a culture, especially a minority culture, especially a minority culture in a time of colonization, is never free and never has its own identity until it has written its own history, preferably in its own writing system. Um, think about that. That is an extraordinary observation. And of course, we don't think about that because we're the top dogs. And so um, he and some, some of his um, ministers and the people of, of Bamon, which is um, a part of Cameroon nowadays, um, came up with all of these symbols. And just have a look at them for a second, because this is him teaching these symbols to his court. So straight away, that means this is important. This is so important. He's, he's calling in all of the important people and teaching them, because the teaching is a critical part of this. But look at the symbols themselves. Many of these actually were um, designs from textiles or from pottery or um, features of the natural landscape. They were indigenous in the very best sense of the word. And um, so here he is teaching it. This was um, probably a, this, this um, uh, painting was probably done around 1900. So over the course of the next 10 years or so, he uh, worked on the script. And by around 1910, it began looking like this. And to our eyes, that looks much more like writing. Um, and which is an interesting thought, which I'm going to come back to in just a second. If we follow up into the present day, um, then here is the modern Bamum syllabary in Unicode. And now it looks very much like writing. It doesn't look like our writing, but it looks very much like writing. And the point that I want to make here is in addition to the fact that um, 
uh, the move to revitalize the Bamon script is really, really powerful and important for the people of Bamon because it visually represents a golden era to them. Because there was this brief period between 1910 and about 1920 when um, King Ibrahim Joya was indeed writing the history of his people in the script. He also wrote a pharmacopoeia, um, a guide to good sex, um, all kinds of useful documents. He built um, a library um, and um, he, he brought in a printing press. And so during that brief period of, of um, flourishing and also of cultural integrity, this script was at the heart of it. When the French took over um, Cameroon after the First World War, they were totally not interested in cultural integrity. Um, they drove him into exile where he died. They destroyed the printing press. They burnt down the buildings. They, they destroyed a lot of these manuscripts. So this is an important point because we don't understand why a culture should be really at attached to its script, especially like in this case, when they're not using it, people don't know how to read and write in the script by and large. We don't understand that because we're never in that danger. It's almost impossible for us to conceive what that would be like. And so it's only by going out into the endangered alphabets that we start seeing this is what writing means. And in particular, this is what writing means to the people who have either individually or collectively developed it and used it and made it an important part of their lives. The other thing that is really um, worth pointing out is that in the narratives about the Bamon script, that word evolve keeps on coming back, improve, evolve, as if those early symbols were in some sense uh, wrong, that um, they didn't reach their, their, their full potential or, or correctness until they look like writing as we understand it. Now, I'm fully in favor of revitalizing the script <coughs> in this form. I just want to make the point that in Victorian England and, and earlier and since, non-phonetic writing forms, ones that had a strong graphic element, were regarded universally as childish and primitive. <laughs> That's really what that whole notion of evolution is all about. And um, we're going to see in the rest of this talk how that really is completely not true. But it is interesting that in talking about the script, the Bamum script, the uh, underlying assumption is that as it became less pictorial and more abstract, it therefore evolved and became more like what writing should be. And what I'm gonna argue is that scripts do not evolve. It's true, writing systems tend to exist somewhere along this continuum. At one extreme, you have um, writing systems or symbol systems that are local, cultural, graphic, familiar in the sense that these symbols are familiar to the people who use them and may well be taken from their surroundings or their everyday lives. They're often idiosyncratic, scriptural, body-centric, manual, and expressive. All those are ideas that I'm going to be talking about in other talks in this series. The other extreme, you have really the, the assumptions that we think of as writing. Universal, abstract, efficient, consistent, simplified, mechanical, and digitizable. And the reason why what the Endangered Alphabets project is doing is important is because that definition over there on the right, if the world thinks of that as being what writing is all about or what should be like, then we're going to make efforts to move writing in that direction. And what I've said here is that scripts may move along that continu continuum, but they do not evolve because with every gain comes loss. 
And as we go further, I'll, I'll show you some examples of what we're losing by thinking of writing in those terms. So here's, um, again, a contemporary dictionary definition of writing. Writing is the process of using symbols, parenthesis, letters of the alphabet, punctuation and spaces, close parenthesis, to communicate thoughts and ideas in a readable form. And I'm gonna propose that at least we think about a different definition. Writing is the process of using symbols, we've taken out the parenthesis, to communicate thoughts and ideas in a visible form. I've taken out the word readable because it's a circular definition. If you can read it, it must be writing. If it's writing, then it's something that you read. And, and as we're going to see, reading is not necessarily connected to writing. There's many ways. Um, I also want to make a, a, a quick observation um, uh, and, and make a connection, connection between writing and music. So if you go back to, again, the end of the 19th century, one of the most popular forms of music um, was, the, was marching band music, military music, very, very popular in both um, England and in the US. Um, and, and I've often asked myself, you know, what if, um, if empire had been successful in, in making that the standard of what music should be all about. And I want to, I want, I want to compare that with the beautiful music that um, Patricia Julian composed for the beginning of this Zoom talk, um, which uh, first of all, I asked her, I said I would like it to echo to some extent the um, Javanese or Balinese gamelan music. I also uh, like the idea that it, it somehow sounded like an island music because many endangered scripts are island scripts. And so she actually has music uh, as waves going in the background and various little sound effects that might conceivably be birds. And when we listen to that, we say, yeah, that's music, right? Um, a definition of music, again, at the end of the 19th century, would have said, no, that isn't music. It has some music in it, but it has these extraneous events that are not music. They are sound effects. They are stuff that is played out there in, in Java. That's not music. Music has been able to expand its conception to include a much wider repertoire or um, uh, inventory of possibility without us thinking, oh, that's not music. Obviously in the 1960s, people said the Beeple, Beatles, that's not music, that's noise. But somehow we've been able to expand our sense of what music is. Writing has not got there yet. So let's talk about NCBD. Um, again, this little carving of mine, it actually says NCBD, apparently. Um, I say apparently because nobody really knows. So um, NCBD uh, from Nigeria, traditionally been used by various leopard secret societies um, in the area before these societies, it was more broadly used, but has since declined following the introduction of Latin script in the 19th and 20th centuries. So this is, this is really interesting because, and, and the reason why I'm introducing CBD is because it attacks one of the notions um, that uh, we believe about writing, which is that it should be uh, uh, universal. It's something, the purpose of having a, a writing system is so that people can read it and understand it. Um, and there are some curious assumptions embedded in that, which I'll get onto in a second. So let's look at other alphabets that were secret. So this is um, the angelic alphabet created by Cornelius Agrippa, um, and it's strongly associated with um, alchemy. Um, and this is an, another alchemical um, secret alphabet created by Dr. John Dee, lived during Elizabeth I's realm in England and may well have been a spy or cryptographer for her. And when you see, when you say a secret alphabet, if we think about the alchemists, one of the reasons why they wanted their symbols to be um, secret and known only to the initiated 
is that they were writing about stuff that was of immense and galactic importance as they understood it, but was so important and so powerful that it could fall into the wrong hands and be misused by um, people who didn't understand it. And so therefore writing became a way of filtering out those who um, could conceivably not understand and, 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 and misuse this information from those who were worthy of, um, of, of uh, understanding it, receiving it, studying it. Um, and I, I, I mentioned this because when we think about NCBD, so here are some of these NCBD symbols, which some of which can be really quite complex. One of the features of writing that kind of goes in the opposite direction to writing being universally comprehensible is that writing really is um, a way of demonstrating belonging. In this case, a very literal kind of belonging because only the initiates in the secret societies um, supposedly understood this. Um, but actually, the notion of belonging is at the heart of writing. And if I use an analogy, in the US, I'm not sure if it happened in Europe as well, um, there are tramp or hobo symbols that would be chalked on the uh, gateposts of houses, and they would uh, be a shorthand for other hobos. And so they would mean um, hostile dog, for example, or friendly household, or um, you, know, uh, you can work here for food or something like that. And in addition to conveying information that only a certain other coterie of people would need or want to understand, it also gave a sense that, um, a sense of, of belonging, that we are a group, we hobos, um, we need to share information. These symbols are our way of doing so. And um, even if this is, uh, is so um, local, as to be uh, incomprehensible to, to other people, or perhaps because it shows how writing can be um, an extraordinarily powerful, important way of bringing a people together um, it, with, with a sort of a common purpose or understanding. One other thought I'm going to mention just briefly, you'll notice that, um, again, some of uh, this writing again would have been dismissed as being you know childish or primitive because it's not written in straight lines in in sort of rank and file linear form and it's not uniform and if you look towards the bottom of this um uh this slide there is this almost uh, map-like narrative um right above the number two with all of these symbols together and one of the things that i'm talking about with uh, with pepper steel in fact is why is it that writing um, in its earliest forms was often nonlinear? And over time, most writing systems started being written in lines. Is this evolution? And um, I'm going to propose that actually it, it sort of is, but not of a kind of intellectual and cultural civilization. It actually has to do with the role of the reader. And as the reader becomes more important and the more text the reader is going to read, the more writing has to be set out in a fashion that is convenient for the reader. And the reader doesn't have to keep on turning things around. But we'll, we'll get into that theory on another occasion. And so here we have um, uh, explanations of some of these uh, symbols. Um, and yes, these are not just decorations. These are absolutely ways of telling stories, of conveying information. Um, and they weren't written on paper by and large. They might have been uh, actually executed in the air as gestures. So there, the whole notion of something being readable, remember, definition of writing, it becomes something different again um, it's not readable in that visible um, uh, sense of having, you know, a something impressed on another material surface. Um, so, as you can see, these are quite uh, complex and sophisticated. There's a famous in CBD, which is actually an account of a trial, 
a, a, like a complete account of what happened at a trial. Um, so we underestimate these at their expense, but also at our own expense, um, because we start losing sight of what the possibilities are of this thing we call writing. Um, this question I raised a few minutes ago about um, writing being universal, or our notion is that writing should be universal. It's really kind of interesting to see, think of all of the words that exist in the English language for various phenomena of spoken language that don't exist for um, written language. So we use the word polyglot, meaning a person who speaks or knows many languages, but there's no word that means a person who uses multiple scripts. And it's interesting that in the West, people typically only know and use one script, yet the average educated South Asian may know several scripts and may routinely use three or four on any given day. The notion that everybody would be better off writing the same alphabet is absolutely a Western notion because that's what we do. And it's so hard for us to imagine doing anything else or to learn other scripts. But clearly it's not rocket science. People all over the world um, use multiple scripts. In fact, I know some of the people involved in this um, Zoom use multiple scripts on a daily basis. You learn them, they're there. And I'm gonna argue that the notion that everybody should use the same script is the product of cultures that only ever need to use one script. And so NCBD seems a little weird and sketchy and odd to us because it's like a secret society and they're using a different alphabet. But in a way, it's a metaphor for the fact that minority cultures all over the world, given their chance, would likely use their own writing system. And we would be just as unnerved and um, uh, uneasy that they did that because we are stuck in ours. Okay, next one, uh, the Adinkra symbols. Okay, um, again, the carving of mine. Um, that, uh, that, by the way, is um, Aya, the fern. Um, and it's a great example of, of the Adinkra symbols because it clearly is a graphic representation of both a physical object, looks like a fern, but also an idea. And because the fern is um, resilient and can grow pretty much anywhere, then um, the symbol, uh, the Adinkra symbol, um, stands for uh, resourcefulness and resilience. And so these symbols were originally um, made in, in, um, in stamp form, carved into, uh, often into wood, um, and then were used as, as stamps to decorate um, the robes of uh, the important people, especially um, for um, important civic occasions. And because each of these symbols had um, its own um, proverbial meaning or uh, stood for a certain abstract quality, it meant that by printing them on the robes and using materials that were available when paper wasn't, this isn't a sign of something primitive, this is a sign of really smart use of natural available resources. And by doing this, you're essentially building up a, a biography of the person wearing those robes in the same way that Maori tattoos in, in New Zealand um, were also an autobiography of the person who was using their skin as the, the, the medium for writing. Um, so here we have a number of Adinkra symbols and um, they have this kind of Again, they have this, what you might say, childish or primitive quality, but that's because, you know, they're carved into wood or presumably into other um, firm uh, vegetable matter um, for stamping. Um, it doesn't mean that they are intellectually simplistic in the slightest. And in fact, what I'm going to argue is that because they are ideographic, they 
um, can be understood by people from multiple language backgrounds. They transcend the limitations of spoken language in the same way that European uh, road signs do the same. You know, if you're going to drive from, uh, you know, Poland to Portugal, how far is that? I know maybe 700 miles. Um, you're going to pass uh, potentially through uh, half a dozen different uh, languages. Need clear systems that indicate um, uh, important information. And of course, these are visual, they are a little crude, but we don't think of them as childish because we understand how important they actually are and they do their job just fine. And of course, there is evidence that we in the West, as a writing culture, actually have started unconsciously recognizing the limitations of the definition of writing that we use. And there has been this revolution which started about 25 years ago, which said, no, writing needs to include other elements in the same way that music can in include sound effects and um, musics from other cultures. And this is, of course, emoji. And so emoji, first of all, uh, are able to convey enormous amounts of information in a single keystroke. Secondly, as pretty much everybody understands, you can actually um, text in a fashion that combines writing and emoji um, in a way that uh, conveys far more information in different ways. So some of it may be literal information, some of it may be phonetic information, some of it may be emotional information. You know, um, Latin alphabet, not very good at emotional information. Um, and we put these two together. And of course, when emojis first came in, and even still to these, this day, many people still stick to this 19th century notion that um, as we become more sophisticated and more adult, we should be using writing in the, um, the Western abstract sounds of speech kind of fashion. And just to give an illustration, every day I see more grown adult men use emojis. There is no excuse for this. Emojis are for children and women. And this uh, was tweeted two years ago. So that notion of um, an intellectual hierarchy at which clearly not only adults, but also adult men, adult Western men are at the top, um, is still alive and unfortunately, well. Um, so in, in just a second, I'm gonna stop screen sharing and pass this over to Alec, because this is in some respects, one of the most sophisticated forms of visual narrative or writing in the, the new broader sense that I'm proposing. So the Chokwe people of Angola um, do this um, amazing form which, can, which combines art and animation and storytelling um, and geometry um, by making dots in the sand, typically using their hand like this as a spacer, and then drawing a line that runs around the dots and telling a story as they draw that line. And the, the only way to, to get the full sense of this is to actually see one of these in, in, in progress. And I don't have any film of anybody doing this, but we do have this great animation, um, which Alec is gonna show you in just a second. And I wish I could credit it. It's on YouTube. Um, I, I cannot find out who made it. And I've tried to contact the maker without a success. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna pass this over to Alec and say to Alec, um, can you show us the story of the rabbit? So it starts out with a pattern of dots and many of these dots actually mean things. And then the storyteller runs his finger. This is literally the storyline. And it's mesmerizing because it's like, where is it gonna go next? Like any good story. And every single dot is gonna be encompassed, but we don't know 
how. And bam, like, like any good story, it ends up back at where it started. And I don't know the details of this story, um, but again, the fable affirms the inviolable rights of the weak. It's a kind of teaching. Um, uh, okay, I'm gonna ask Alec to write, I'm gonna go back to start sharing my own screen again, just now. Uh, we're right here, Microsoft PowerPoint. Okay, thank you very much. So that uh, obviously it'd be even better if I could tell you what the story actually was. Um, but the storyline is following the rabbit as the rabbit is going on this journey. The dots represent points along the journey, but they can also represent ideas. Um, and to do something like that for us, you would have to use something like, I don't know, um, Adobe After Effects, or you'd actually have to do what they do, which is to sit, you know, sort of squat down by the sand and, and make the dots and tell the story as you, uh, um, as you run your finger around it. And it is um, so uh, fascinating and so compelling that there is actually a whole subset of geometry devoted to um, Lusona dots. Um, and there's very, very little information. So if anybody here knows anything about Lusona or is, uh, knows anybody who might know anything, I would love it if you would get in touch with me. Um, and so all we have for now is um, the story of, uh, this is by one of the very, very few anthropologists who uh, actually went to the Chokwe and, and studied the, um, uh, the Lusona being used. They refer to proverbs, fables, games, riddles, animals, etc., and play an important role in the transmission knowledge of wisdom from one generation to the next. Yes! So that isn't just oral tradition. It's not just written tradition. It's this fascinating combination of the, of the both. Um, and here, because this is being recorded, um, I'm going to send out the link to everybody who is registered for this talk. Um, you can go to this uh, YouTube channel and um, watch some more of, uh, of the Lusona at work. So, um, as I promised at the beginning, I am going to implore you to help support uh, the work that we do in general, including these talks, um, by supporting the Endangered Alphabets Project, which you can do at our website. There's a support us um, button. But right now, our Kickstarter campaign um, is in, in progress and we really need your support. Um, you can take the link from the recording or you can simply go to Kickstarter campaign and type in writing beyond writing and it will take you to our campaign. We are the Endangered Alphabets Project. Our main website is endangeredalphabets.com. The Atlas of Endangered Alphabets, as many of you know, is at endangeredalphabets.net. Um, I want to thank um, Alec for all of his work, for Patricia, for the music, for you. And now I say, well, your turn. Questions, comments, suggestions, useful bits of information, information you know and I don't. And of course, um, we're going to have a certain amount of time now, but if you ran out of time, by all means, throw these in the chat. I'm delighted to see how much stuff is in the chat already. So, um, 